Good morning. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education here at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. We're so excited to have you join us today for our legacy lecture. Before I turn things over to the speaker and get started, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping things and a few upcoming programs. So if you do have questions for today's speaker, please leave them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll moderate those questions at the end of today's talk. We are broadcasting live today on Zoom as well as Facebook. The talk will be recorded and shared out on the National First Ladies Library YouTube page. So if you don't get a chance to see the whole thing, if you wanna share it with someone who you think might be interested, please head there for this talk as well as all sorts of other programs related to the First Ladies. So as far as upcoming programs go, we have so many exciting things coming up this spring that I wanna mention very quickly to you so we can get started. The National First Ladies Library hosts a film series with Stark Library, where you can pre-screen films on YouTube. We have one coming up this coming week called I Know a Woman Like That. It's all about aging, and it's a documentary that features many, many amazing women from Gloria Steinem to Eartha Kitt. We're going to host a live um, moderated discussion on Zoom on April 13th. So please register if you're interested in watching the film and chatting with us about it next week. We also have our curator series and we are um, going to host the Peabody Essex Museum's curator, uh, Petra Sli Slinkard, Director of Curatorial Affairs, who is going to speak to us about Made It, the Women Who Revolutionize Fashion, their latest exhibition, which has a number of First Lady related items, including some amazing work by seamstress Elizabeth Keckley. So we're super excited about that. And we would love for you to dust off your old Almond Brothers records and join us for our latest installment of Cooking with the First Ladies uh, live. So we have been working with Sarah of the First Ladies cooking blog, and she is hosting a live Rosalind Carter inspired experience. We're going to be cooking quite a few things from peanut butter pie to the Carter's cornbread. So if you are up for taking a trip to Plains, Georgia, please join us next this later this month. And you can register for any of these programs via the National First Ladies Facebook page, our website, or our Eventbrite. And I'll put that info in the chat for you as well. Um, we also host an ongoing book club. Um, this month, the, um, actually next month, our book is a fiction, fictional book called White Houses featuring Eleanor Roosevelt. And we're gonna do a little compare contrast. We're gonna do fiction and then read the latest bio inspired by Eleanor Roosevelt as well. Um, so we're starting out with White Houses and a discussion of that book in May. And then we're gonna give you the summer to read the biography. So that should be really fun. And last but not least, I wanna mention two really amazing programs that are inspired by an exhibition that is currently on view at the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. The um, exhibition features some work from our collection and we will be hosting the curator of that exhibition for our next legacy lecture on May 5th. Gwendolyn Dubois-Shaw uh, um, will be speaking about the exhibition um, at the National Portrait Gallery called um, Every Eye is Upon Me, First Ladies of the United States. It's the very first exhibition that has ever been organized by um, their Museum of First Lady Portraiture. So if you visited and seen the Hall of Presidents and seen some of those amazing First Lady portraits, this is actually the first exclusive exhibition. So we're excited to get a taste of that. And we will also be hosting the education department of the National Portrait Gallery for a teacher talk on May 20th. So if you know an educator out there who you think would be really interested in incorporating some of these portraits into their curriculum, please have them connect up with us. We would love to have them. 
So that is everything on the horizon today. And without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker today to you all. Karen Donak is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of History at Muskingum University in New Concord, Ohio. Her first book, as Long as We Both Shall Love, The White House Wedding in Post-War America was published by New York University Press in 2013. And she is currently working on a book about media responses and representation of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And that is what she will speak to us about today. So uh, without further ado, I wanna turn things over to Karen and again, um, any questions that you might have for Karen today, I would love for you to put those in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the talk. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thank you, Allison, for the introduction and all of the exciting things that you've got coming up. Okay, I am sharing my screen. And can I get a confirmation that people see this screen? There should be a slide or a PowerPoint slideshow with opportunity for an American Versailles, Jacqueline Kennedy and presidential image making. Okay, it says to me that it's sharing my screen. So I'm going to believe it. And hopefully you can see my face in the corner. I have the video set up. Um, so thanks to Michelle and to Allison for their work on the Legacy Lecture and also to the First Lady's Library for the invitation to present. Um, as Allison said, uh, I am working on a book length project right now that is starring Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Um, I'm very specific. It is not a biography, so it is not a traditional biography, I should say, um, that Jacqueline Bouvier was born on this day and then this happened and then this happened. Um, the kind of language that I'm using for it is that it's much more of a cultural biography um, and that it is very much about how the media responded to, um, represented Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis over the course of her public life. Um, and there'll definitely be play into that ideas from the book in today's presentation. Um, and I think you'll see today that this is sort of the beginning when Jackie Kennedy is first lady, the start of her being the most famous woman in the world, and she will be for decades. Um, as such, she becomes this kind of avatar for all women or responses to her serve as this sort of barometer for responses to women more broadly. Um, and I think the work that I've done and I've done, written about six chapters, it is very much when Jackie Kennedy seems to be in service to her family, to her husband, to her nation, she is very widely applauded that the coverage she receives is quite positive. When there's an interpretation that she is working on behalf of her own interests or in self-interest, that is when she opens herself up to critique. Um, so in many ways, Jackie Kennedy is a barometer for women from the 60s through the 90s, and also relevant to conceptualizations of women in public today. Um, so today, my emphasis is on Jackie Kennedy as first lady, and even more narrow than that, with an emphasis on her first 100 days um, in the White House when she was working to define the parameters of her role, as well as contributing to the aesthetic of her husband's administration, an aesthetic um, which was very much tied to the kind of politics he wished to affect and the image he wished to communicate. I think for a long time, historians considered John Kennedy and questioned whether he was more style than substance. Um, I think it is a mistake to suggest you have to be one or the other. And historian Michael Hogan argues that style was part of Kennedy's substance. And I am very taken with that idea. And I think Jackie Kennedy is part and parcel of the kind of style slash substance that was part of John Kennedy's administration. Um, he and John Kennedy and his team scale are very much part of the reason why the Kennedys or why his administration is looked back upon in such a positive light. Um, 
and the aesthetic that goes along with Kennedy's new frontier, the sort of language or the ideas of vitality or bigger culture, intellect, excellence. Um, Jackie Kennedy was very much part of contributing to that image and that look and that style and that aesthetic. She is essential to the image making of this administration. And I would go back further. I think from the time she marries John Kennedy, she is very important to the kind of image he hopes to communicate. And I mean, when, when she marries him, he's still wearing like white socks with black shoes. He's being mistaken for a page when he goes to Congress. Um, you know, he has his shirt tails hanging out and she, she's like, no, you cannot do that anymore. If you want to be taken seriously, like you need to dress for the job you want, not the one you have. So I think the polish she gives him is not just White House oriented, but it's happening like throughout the course of their relationship. Um, I'm gonna start off by sharing, and it's from my original screen too, but I'm moving forward here, um, an image of one of the many Life magazine covers on which Jacqueline Kennedy appeared. And this one is August, 1959. Um, it seems certain that John Kennedy would seek his party's nomination um, to run for president the next year, but it was not certain that he would be the choice. Um, it's very striking to me to think about this senator's wife who's not chosen to be the Democratic nominee and that his wife is on the cover of Life magazine, which is like the preeminent like middle class, middle America periodical of the time. Um, I think about this image so much too because the Kennedy, his team, John Kennedy's people are like, God, what, how are people gonna respond to Jackie? Like there's a lot of nail biting. Is she too young? Is she too beautiful? She's too smart. She's too fashionable. She's too cosmopolitan. She's not at all like Mimi Eisenhower. She's really not at all like Bess Truman. Yikes. And yet they're like, yes, of course, we would love to have her on the cover of Life magazine. Um, I mean, she looks like a million bucks on the cover here, which I mean, allow me to say that like about every image that I'm, I will share with you. Um, the title that Donald Wilson, the author, gives this is John Kennedy's Lovely Lady. So we're already getting the sort of framing that Jackie Kennedy gets pre-First Ladyness. Um, the author, Donald Wilson, describes her as quiet, cultured, unpolitical. Um, and I'm sort of putting forward here ideas about Jackie Kennedy that are widely communicated and re-communicated and re-communicated. Like there are these truisms about her, I think that people accept unpolitical, apolitical, not interested in politics. And John Kennedy gives his two cents in this Life magazine. She breathes all the political gases that flow around us, but she never seems to inhale them. And I mean, honestly, if I wanted to find like quintessential Jackie Kennedy image pieces to share with you, like I could not do better than this. So the internal, like it's all the highlights that it's her with Car like baby Caroline. Um, John Kennedy is going off to work. They're in front of the Georgetown home they inhabit before they go White House. Um, Jackie, of course, looks beautiful in a shift dress inside the halls of that home. She's walking and like her commitment to fitness and her need sometimes to be alone with her thoughts. Of course, she is on a horse. Um, and then transitioning again, of course, she is at the beach. Um, being a mother at a favorite seaside home. These are images, oh, down in the center here, we've got her surrounded by the Kennedys. Like you can't swing a stick without hitting these kind of images of Jackie Kennedy. I think while she's a Senator's wife and even then sort of segueing into the first lady stuff. And then like in thinking about her as this political spouse, helpful partner to a husband on the stump. Um, and she's at a dinner. She's like, she's very ornamental, I think, in these pictures. Um, she's like glad handing with a lady at a democratic committee. And that is the sort of stuff like she's very not into. Like I will give it to you, like Jackie Kennedy not being a political creature when it comes to like small talking with people who are very into politics. But I would bring attention to this headline the helpful partner to a husband on the stump. I think she is cast as very adjacent and that he is the public figure and he is doing the thing. And as John Kennedy says, she breathes all the political gases that flow around us, 
but she never seems to inhale them. I take issue with this. I, she inhales. I think she just does not get high the way John Kennedy and people who are into politics and choose politics as their lives and are intoxicated by politics. That is not Jackie Kennedy. But I think this truism of her being apolitical or unpolitical is not true. I think she actually is very politically astute. I think she has a tremendous understanding of politics and particularly like style and image, which are very much part and parcel of her husband's campaign and then his administration. I think she's very good at these things. Um, I think for a long time, she has been disregarded as this politically astute person. I mean, in part, because I think definitions of politics have been so narrow that it is legislative or it is policy or it is voting or a political spouse is somebody like Lady Bird Johnson, who's like standing over Lyndon's shoulder. He's on the phone and he's like bird and hands it over or sometimes doesn't even say anything. It's just like, take this and deal with it. That is not what Jackie Kennedy is. Um, I think historians and a lot of historians who do women's history have started to be broader in their definition of what, what politics is and can be and what is a political contribution. I think that is part of what's going on or that's what I'm doing with Jackie Kennedy. I think also for a long time, there's this disregard of her as a political, a political being or somebody who is politically savvy because there continues to be this disconnect between somebody who was beautiful and somebody who is also smart. Um, and especially in the 1960s with the sort of media coverage of this time. Um, so this is just a little bit of Life Magazine dealing with her, me sort of setting things up um, for what I am thinking about moving forward here. Uh, for me, thinking about these 100 days, like main points that I will emphasize, she is aware of what she is undertaking. Like she has a sense of what First Lady will be and what it is going to ask of her. Um, and I think she is very smart at recognizing that it is work and that she understands the labor that will be required of this unpaid, unofficial, non-office where there will be very clear expectations that she is there and is doing. I mean, what that is, is open to interpretation, but I think her sense that this is labor is there uh, even before they moved to the White House. I think she also is very conscious of what she wants to do. And she would probably not like me saying she has an agenda, but I think that is a fair word. Um, and she is deliberate and she is conscious and nothing happens by accident, that she is somebody who knows exactly what she wants to communicate and like puts the wheels in motion and makes the plays to communicate what it is she wishes to have out there. And sort of circling back, you don't do this if you are not like a keen political observer. I'm gonna take us now to January 20th, 1961, when John Kennedy is being inaugurated and not he, but his wife is on the cover of Time magazine. And again, the casting of her is apolitical. And I mean, the cover is sort of doing this for us where we're getting classic Jackie Kennedy. The pearls are giving us her status. We've got the White House in the background. There's a baby carriage because she has basically just birthed a child as they are moving into the White House. And internally, the, the magazine reports, unlike Pat Nixon or Muriel Humphrey, Jackie takes no part in her husband's political planning. Jack wouldn't, couldn't have a wife who shared the spotlight with him, she says. Her political role, Time says about Jackie Kennedy, is mostly visual. She has never consulted about political matters. Um, no, John Kennedy is not saying to her, so Jackie, what do you think about Vietnam? Or man on the moon, yes or no? Like that's not what's going on here. But I think in the capacity of other components of the new frontier, where we're thinking about culture, we're thinking about um, modernity, we're thinking about excellence, like she is a voice that is important. I'm very struck by her talking about Jack, Jack, not being able to share the spotlight when I'm like, hello, who is on the cover of this magazine? 
And I mean, across the course of his administration, the spotlight will stray from him to her repeatedly. And I think much to his chagrin, like I do not think he is in love with that. Plus sometimes I think he is very in love with that. I mean, obviously we're dealing with a complex person here. But anyway, in any case, she's on the cover of Time Magazine and we get a sense of how she's negotiating what the role is she's about to go headfirst into. Um, and Time, I think is very fair to her in some ways and says she's gonna live as a sinusure. Every action would lead to a reaction, whether she wants to or not, she will influence taste or style. Um, the magazine says. And she understands the shift in her status, and so does time. They predict a difficult, demanding, and often thankless role. And she says, I feel as though I had just turned into a piece of public property. And I love this quote, and I like I feel very affirmed by it because I think, yes, she has, and that's why she is perfect for the kind of book that I want to write. She gets so much coverage and she is so talked about. And she is in so many ways, I think as the first lady, when there are so few women in the media po politics spotlight, even if she is not there as a politician, she's the, the, a woman receiving coverage. So she's very much a representative for ways of thinking about women at this time. Um, I think there is this consideration of her she has this elite education. She very clearly is a bright person. She is an intellectually curious person. Um, but she has these displays of political naivete. And people wonder if she's adopted, like as time calls it, this dumb door, a masquerade um, that people claim that she had used when she was a young woman. And I mean, like so many in the 1950s who are like, God, if I, I cannot present as brainy, because who will like me then? Like I cannot scare off people with my intellect. Um, but her plans for the White House as communicated in this article, talk about or represent her, her intelligence and also her savvy and communicating views. Since the election, she'd spent time, time says, reading every available book on the White House and she had acquired a connoisseur's knowledge of the place. Um, she wanted to change the White House, she says, in subtle ways. She says the White House is an 18th and 19th century house, should be kept as a period house. Whatever one does, one does gradually to make a house a more lived in house with beautiful things of its period. Um, she had a plan in mind, even if she talked about having subtle changes to come. But I think she's also showing a savvy and an astuteness here where she's gauging expectations. And I mean, people are worried that she's going to move in there and like turn the place upside down, like that she loves art. Oh God, is she gonna go to the White House and bring all modern art there? Which in no way, shape or form is what she wants to. So by talking about things happening gradually, I think, again, she's like gauging expectations and paving a way for herself to do what she would like to do with as little pushback as possible. Um, she approached her impending change in position strategically with plans to set her own pace. Um, she was going to move into the office, she says, with two secretaries and a public relations aide. Maybe Eisenhower's very limited public role had been handled by her social secretary or the presidential news secretary. That was not going to be possible for Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, even during the 1960 campaign, she had received so much correspondence and so much attention. Um, and she was very reticent to give up her privacy. So I think her idea was, I'm going to have a team to help me with this. Um, 40 people ultimately work to support Jackie Kennedy's public duties. Um, and she's very John Kennedy-esque yes, here, um, very interested in loyalty and efficiency. And so like mines the existing Kennedy team to bring people to her staff. So she has this Mary Gallagher who had worked for John Kennedy since, I think since he was a member of the House of Representatives. She's got Pamela Turner who had formerly been a press secretary of Pierre Salinger's staff, and Letitia Baldridge, who was her friend from Miss Porter School. So she likes having people who know her and know what she's like around her um, to support her and help her in her official and professional capacity. And I would say the hiring of this staff reveals her view of this position as one of labor, um, one that required organization and assistance to proceed as she wished. And I mean, I, I this is, I think a lot of people think this about Jackie Kennedy. I, I think this is true. 
She wants people who will help her with the projects that inspire her and people who will take over the helm for things she doesn't want to do. And she is somebody who I think is like, I don't really want to be in this mix, but if I am, I'm going to do the things I love and then see what I can do to have the other stuff taken care of. And I mean, her staff and also like on the phone with Ladybird, can you sit in for me? Um, one pre-inauguration article reported Kennedy, her secretary says she is amazingly well organized for the new life that begins Friday. Um, in her memo to press secretary Pamela Turner, the very first press secretary ever employed for a first lady, Jackie Kennedy directed, my press releases will be minimum information given with maximum politeness. And they have like this code in the White House, the PBO, the polite brush off. Um, there is an effort to protect privacy whenever possible. After she had served a year as First Lady, Newsweek offered a summation of the Jacqueline Kennedy ethos. And I have the quote for you here because I think it is excellent and like actually very representative of her style of like First Ladying. I shall be seen, not heard, at least not heard much. I shall discourage fashion stories in every way except by the clothes I wear. I shall restore the White House to the way it ought to have been. I shall have distinguished artists in as guests and performers. I shall rear my children myself in privacy. I shall get involved only in projects I have time for, but I shall get very involved in those. And yes, this is January 1, 1962, but this is also a very good summation, I think, of her in her first 100 days. Like this is representative of what you see coming out of the White House as she's preparing to go in there and in these first couple months as being First Lady. Kennedy advisor Ted Sorensen recalled that her distance from the press should not really have been a surprise. During and following the campaign, she provided no indication that she intended to engage in any sort of partnership with the press. She was not unlike John Kennedy, who enjoyed cultivating relationships, or she was unlike him in this capacity. But what they did have in common was an approach to the media world that expressed a desire to wield some measure of control, um, to provide good news or stories of their liking and try to shunt efforts to cover topics that did not fit with the image they wished to present. Um, and Mrs. Kennedy like tried to have this division of public and private life. She would provide information about public activities but she wished for her private life to be off limits. And this leads to a fairly contentious relationship with members of the press corps, particularly those assigned to cover the first lady, which were largely like the women reporters of the various news outlets. Um, as she prepared to make her home in the White House, she insisted that fashion was the least of her concerns. Uh, she blanched at the extent or obtrusiveness of reporting on her look but obviously the care with which she cultivated her personal style revealed that fashion was a concern for her. And I think it is like, she wants to look a certain way. She just doesn't want that to be the headline. Like she does not enjoy, I think what she sees as a kind of tawdry coverage or like fascination with her look. Um, her concern over her image was very likely that a concern over the public image she presented both on her own and alongside her husband. Time's inaugural profile, so that 1961, January, it highlights the visual appearance of Jacqueline Kennedy and suggests this is her primary contribution to her husband's administration. And I mean, they say that her role likely primarily will be one of decor. Um, with more attention given to her style than to points of interest for the First Lady, coverage suggests that her fashion influence would be the influence of her position. That suggestion, I say, failed to take into account the actual scope and import of that power. Um, what the look might suggest to and about women both in the United States and abroad. And I think that kind of limited expectation fails to consider the work Jacqueline Kennedy would take and did take as First Lady and what the public nature of her actions and selected projects had the potential to communicate about herself, but also about her husband and his administration and his vision for the nation. The look she crafted was just not her own, and it wasn't merely ornamental. Her style served to shape public conceptions of her husband's presidency and the potential of the presidential home and the office more broadly. And so moving forward here, thinking about the first hundred days, I have three areas um, that I want to bring attention to. And I have a lot of the sources referenced to if people are interested in following up and learning more um, about these various topics. Uh, I'm going to focus on her look, like her fashion, her self-presentation, 
um, I'm going to focus on the entertainments that she very much had a hand in determining and shaping. And then I'm going to focus on that White House restoration, because even though the big reveal White House tour that she does on CBS is in February of 1962, it is before even going to the White House that she's like, first order of business, we fix up that White House. So ooh, I'll start you off here with Oleg Cassini, and you'll see I'm referencing his Thousand Days of Magic, dressing Jacqueline Kennedy for the White House. Um, and I mean, Jackie Kennedy is in her hospital bed, having delivered John Jr. via cesarean section, and she's like, okay, I'm going to be first lady. What am I going to wear? Um, and she has invited all of these designers to come visit her in the hospital. Um, and in Oleg Cassini's Thousand Days of Magic, I mean, it actually, he tells a very good story. Um, he walks in there and he sees sketches from all of these other designers. And he's like, uh-uh, that's not what I'm here for. And essentially says to Jackie Kennedy, listen, I wanna work with you, but if you work with me, you work with me, like exclusively. I'm not partnering up with a bunch of other dudes who are gonna have like competing visions for what your look should be. I'm telling you, I will create a concept for you. And I'm not going to recycle anything. I'm not going to like go back in my closets or my old sketchbooks. The look will be fresh and it will be first lady Jacqueline Kennedy, the look. And his quote here, I want you to be the most elegant woman in the world. I think you should start from scratch with a look that will set trends and not follow them. And I mean, I think Jackie Kennedy is like, ding, yes, that is what I would like to. And I think... I've got my slides printed out here. I should make sure I've got the right one. But yeah, I'll do this. We spoke of how fashion is a mirror of history, he says in their combo. We discussed the message her clothes would send, simple, youthful, elegant, and how she would reinforce, man, how she would reinforce the image of her husband's administration through her presence. Yes, and I would say not only the image, but also the values, the characteristics, what he wanted to communicate would come through in part through Jacqueline Kennedy's look. Um, and he says to her too, man, and I know she loves this. Uh, he said to her that her style in regard to fashion choices and beyond had the opportunity for an American Versailles. And I mean, I think there is this idea about her, the White House, the presidency, that office, having this sort of regal bearing, that it should be a place of glamour, and culture and beauty and excellence. That is very much in keeping with what she thinks the White House and her husband's administration should be. And I mean, that her look could communicate this also sits well with her. And I mean, she loves fashion. I think this is fair. And when I say previously that she doesn't want it reported and like the tawdry component, I mean, I think she doesn't want Jackie Kennedy spends $20,000 in Paris. Like she does not like that sort of like rifling through her receipts. Um, and I mean, if I segue just for one second, like this is a, a thing that I'm very crazed about. Like, I think that people wanna go wild and say, Jacqueline Kennedy looks so incredible. She's so wonderful. Look at how she represents this nation. And they're like, but did you see how much she spent? Yes, if you want to look good, it costs money. It also takes time. Like. If you want these things, you have to accept other components of it. Sorry, I digress and now I'll move forward. Clearly, Oleg Cassini is making her look like a queen. And I mean, this is the night of inauguration. And I mean, I think we can expect this. Like the ball gown is gonna be incredible. Like maybe we should take a moment of silence to be like, thank you for this dress, Oleg Cassini. And I, again, I would also like to re reflect she had a baby two months ago, and this is what we get from Jackie Kennedy. So again, go for it. Ole Cassini is actually much more interested in what Jackie Kennedy is going to wear to the inauguration. And I mean, this is the best. He wants her to stand out. And so what he presents to her is this. A fawn wool coat with a sable collar and a restrained flare. He wants to keep focus on her face, but have a complete look. So he goes to the pillbox hat. Um, and again, he says, I want you to set trends and not follow them. 
Yes, yes, and yes. The New York Times reports on this look, Mrs. Kennedy has a reputation for wearing smart clothes smartly. And at the inauguration, it was easy to see why. Um, yeah, he wants her to stand out from everybody else and she does. God, she looks so fresh and so young and so vibrant. It's like zero degrees. There has been a snowstorm of like six to eight inches. Her walking, so again, Life Magazine, of course, her walking with Kennedy and like the crew of gentlemen, it's like a breath of fresh air. Like one of these things is not like the other. If you look at this image, you cannot take your eyes off her. And I mean, it's also like the cutest with like her boots and walking in the snow. Here she is on the podium. And I mean, the real injustice here is to poor Dwight Eisenhower because he looks aged. And I mean, putting him next to Jackie Kennedy is like the worst of friends. Like nothing could have made him look older than to have her sitting next to him. And like potentially my favorite slide and caption of all of the things from today, Jackie Kennedy with the political wives and like Kennedy sisters in the background. So you've got Lady Bird, Mamie, Pat Nixon. Cassini had said, all the other ladies will be loaded down with furs like a bunch of bears, but dressed like this, you'll stand out. Not only will you look even younger, but you'll make the president seem more up to date. So, I mean, in the world of fashion, forget the first hundred days, day one, Jackie Kennedy is creating youth, vitality, new frontiers, new generation. All of this, she is reflecting in her look adjacent to her husband. I would say the freshness and vibrancy that Cassini aspired to in his designs for Jackie were also part of her aspiration for the feeling of the White House. Her style was about more than just clothes. Letitia Baldridge, and I move forward here, Jackie's social secretary, here she is in the state dining room, um, recalled that White House parties of previous administrations have been stiff and glacial. Uh, Jackie believed the addition of warmth did not exclude dignity and a sense of awe at being a guest in the president's home. So she tried to personalize White House parties. Um, during the first two years of the administration, she participated in a total of 136 events, uh, entertaining 74 leaders, almost all of them in the White House. Baldridge recalled from years as Kennedy's social secretary, it was days and days of agonized planning um, that there really was tremendous attention to detail and one of Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy's biographers writes, it's the first lady who receives credit for the successes and blame for the failures. I think Jackie Kennedy understands that exactly. Um, Kennedy approached parties with conscious planning and attention to an endless number of details. And after an event, she would do these longhand notes on legal pad um, with her thoughts on the party and suggestions for improvement. Um, I mean, I think the image the image of her husband's administration, again, is part and parcel of this. The first party they have is just 10 days after they've moved into the White House. And the difference in tone and style is tremendous. Um, again, Mrs. Kennedy's personal secretary claimed they were precedent shattering. Um, no longer did guests arrive to the White House and wait in a long receiving line um, to be greeted by the president and first lady. Instead, they mingled as the Kennedys like went throughout the room. They didn't stiff sit sit stiffly at formal dining tables instead, and I'll move here. And again, this is Letitia Baldridge in the Kennedy style. She also has a book of diamonds and diplomats that talks about her life in various locations. But rather than these long tables or these U-shaped tables, they do these tables of like six, eight, 10 people um, where people could speak to each other. And there were cocktails and like ashtrays everywhere. Um, instead of having giant flower arrangements, they're much more muted. Um, Jackie loved to have candlelight as the way of lighting the room, a fire in the hearth. She paints the walls or has the walls painted a lighter color, but I think that she's looking um, to have it be a much more intimate, enjoyable setting. I think under the Eisenhower's, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm honored I went to the White House and like Dear Diary, I went to the White House, that was good. But this is, I went to the White House and I had a good time. Um, the New York Times Magazine does a report on this um, and talks about this home-like atmosphere that, what does it say here? She achieved success in transplanting the lived-in informality of her private home in Georgetown 
to the museum-like formal reception rooms of the White House. And again, here's, I'm sorry, this image is not great, but I did a scan here. Um, but again, a much more intimate setting. And I'll move forward here. This is from the Kennedy Library in Boston um, at a dinner honoring Stephen Smith and his, John's sister, Jean Kennedy Smith. I, like, I think this image is great in part, like in the lower left-hand corner where you've got somebody sort of turned around and like, remarking to buds like how she's feeling like having combos like I think that it just looks fun and exciting like this is a thing you want to go to and like very not notorious that's not the right word like famously I guess that these parties last until like two o'clock in the morning Lyndon Johnson falls over doing the twist and I will say like the Kennedys are geniuses because I was looking everywhere for like people doing the twist at the White House the images do not exist <laughs> Um, but I think good conversation, like it's an enjoyable sort of event, um, informally gracious way of a wealthy, culturally aware, well-traveled family. And I think this move away from convention or like stuffiness, it's also leading us into like the more casual vibe of the 1960s. Like, again, we're not following trends, we're setting them here. Um, these entertainments, I think Jackie Kennedy would say are representative of her husband's administration um, a way of entertaining international guests and also, of course, a way of highlighting culture. Um, and I think her sense is the White House and Washington, D.C. should be at the center of American culture and celebration. And she sets a tone for the arts that would encourage culture around the country. After the October 1961 performance by the American Shakespeare Festival, her biographer, Charlotte Curtis, so the White House was replaced Carnegie Hall, the Metropolitan, the Palace was the goal of many performers. Uh, Pierre Salinger, again, Kennedy's press secretary, thought the high point of the cultural activities was the concert given by Pablo Casals. Um, and it's at an event honoring Governor Luis Munoz Marin of, of Puerto Rico. And, you know, Casals had been in a self-imposed exile from nations recognizing Francisco Franco. Um, he was impressed by John Kennedy's efforts for peace and he wanted to honor the president. So he comes and gives his first official performance in the US since 1928. Um, the New York Times suggests this event transcended mere music making. Um, I've got a quote here from Harold Schoenberg who reviews this for the New York Times. The concentration on serious music last night was an indication of one aspect of the new frontier. President and Mrs. Kennedy have been highly responsive to cultural elements in the American musical scene and have been making efforts to raise the standard not only for the White House, but also for Washington. So again, in this capacity of culture, of excellence, of internationalism, of diplomacy, and like a kind of soft diplomacy, Jackie Kennedy is at the center of what John Kennedy is up to. I've got another image here, and I like the color one too, where you get like the vibrancy, and it just is very alive. It felt by many creative figures in America that the interest in the arts displayed by the White House cannot help but spark an awareness from the public about the importance of culture in the American scheme of things. So again, youth, elegance, modernity. I think people like to, or historians I should say, have talked about John Kennedy and like his appeal being, he's one of us, but he's also the best of us. I would argue that that is true of like this, this first presidential couple in the image that they convey and in the way they are represented in the media. And, and of course, like there are other things going on underneath the surface. But in terms of what is the picture coming out of the White House, it is aspirational um, that this is, this is a vision of the nation that we would like to present, that it is cultured, that it is <sighs> interesting, that it is enjoyable, you know, that it is a very positive and modern look at American life. Jackie Kennedy's sense of the White House as like this important location in American life goes beyond hosting foreign dignitaries or having these cultural reflections. Um, she believes also that the House should communicate the breadth and the scope of the nation's history and heritage. And she endeavored to ensure that she did this while she was first lady. Um, Again, shortly after John Jr.'s birth, she goes and does a tour with Mamie Eisenhower um, of the White House. I mean, that is, I would say, stilted at best. Um, Mamie Eisenhower does not love Jackie Kennedy. In the aftermath, 
Mamie Eisenhower says to J.B. West, who's the chief usher of the White House, she's planning to redo every room in this house. You've got quite a project ahead of you. And J.B. West's memoir, he has quite italicized. Um, in what West called the voice she reserved for disapproval, Mamie continued, there certainly are going to be some changes made around here. But Mamie is not wrong. Jackie Kennedy is horrified by her tour of the White House. Um, she thinks the furnishings are totally outdated. The decor, she's, I think she says it looks like a rundown motel. The White House restoration is a priority like from that moment moving forward. I mean, probably even before. The Kennedys go down to Palm Beach for Christmas every year. And she orders all these books from the Library of Congress where she's like, I need to get to work here. Like, what is the history of this place? How could it be reflected in material culture? What do I do? And I think her husband's administration is nervous. Again, like people are like, God, is she gonna tamper with the White House? So she has to do this in a strategic way. And she does. Very early on upon taking up residence in the White House, um, Jackie's right-hand gal, Pamela Turner, informs the press that Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy, wants to share some startling things she has learned historically about the White House. And I'm gonna move forward here. This is also from the JFK Library, a February 23rd, 1961 press release, um, where she follows up on what had been a reveal that she planned a major cultural project to furnish the White House with authentic items from the time of its construction. Um, and here she lays out and she's very pumped to get Henry Francis DuPont to be the chairman of this fine arts committee. Um, she has David Finley, who is also part of this talk on behalf um, of the importance of this project. And he talks about Mount Vernon and Monticello having been preserved and furnished to carry out a historical theme. The White House has no theme. Um, and I mean, part of it is like people have brought things into and out of the White House at various times. Like as administrations have left, people have sold things in the White House. Like it just is this strange conglomeration of items that does not tell a story um, or does not communicate the history of this location or I think the gravitas of the office. And I'm gonna go forward here. Not only is she saying, okay, I'm gonna have DuPont and Dave Finley. Also, here are all these other people who are gonna be part of the Fine Arts Commission. Um, here are their bios, here are their chops. This is a legit operation. I know what I'm doing. Um, and over the course of the first six months in the White House, Pam Turner provides press release after press release about like furniture and China contents in the White House, um, hiring a curator, Lorraine Waxman Pierce, about the acquisition of furniture from George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, James and Dolly Madison, James Monroe, Daniel Webster, so on and so forth. And because they're like, we know everybody, everybody is worried about Jackie Kennedy being this Francophile. She loves France so much. On July 4th, they put out a press release that says, where non-American furnishings have been acquired, it is because they have some connection with American history or are similar to furnishing used by presidents in the White House in the past. The press releases also emphasize that many of the acquisitions were donations and thus were not financed by taxpayer dollars. So I mean, Kennedy is like crossing her T's and dotting her I's for someone cast as apolitical over and over again. She has a tremendous grasp of the necessity of doing things the right way and in a manner to limit potential critique. Up oh, here we are again, Life Magazine, September 1, 1961, cover story about Jackie and her absorbing project. Um, and I think that what is very good about the photo essay accompanying this is that it gives a very clear communication of the exacting standards Jackie Kennedy is using in the name of this project. Everything in the White House, she says, must have a reason for being there. It would be sacrilege merely to redecorate it, a word I hate. It must be restored. And that has nothing to do with decoration. That is a question of scholarship. So I mean, I think like the rolling of eyes where it's like, oh God, here she goes redecorating the White House. Like she wants none of that. Um, she talks about the evolving nature of the executive office. She talks about the different tastes of the men who had served as president and the way the White House should communicate that to the public. Um, and I mean, it, this is a pet project, but it's not one that is undertaken lightly. Um, and I think she's very sp 
specific in communicating the experts and the expertise they bring to this project. She talks about how she celebrated when DuPont agreed to do this. I didn't know or care what Mr. DuPont's politics were. Without him on the committee, I didn't think we would accomplish much. With him, I knew there would be no criticism. The day he agreed to be chairman was the biggest red letter day of all. And I think she also is reflecting that she understands it's not just him. He's also bringing this powerful network of antique dealers, collectors, and potential donors. I mean, she understands how these things work. Here we have First Lady brings history and beauty to the White House. There is a way that there's the communication of this is like a treasure hunt and she's treasure hunting. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. I think she enjoys this. She takes a lot of joy from it. Like she's going into like storage units and she's in, you know, her dress here, but they, JB West often talks about her like always being in pants and like coming up on the, the service elevator with like stuff that she has found in the basement. Everything must have a reason for being here. Um, she also talks about like people being nervous to donate because things had done like these disappearing acts. Um, as she attempted to solicit donations from collectors, she reassured them this would not happen. And to that end, she works with New Mexico Senator Clinton Anderson, chair of the state Senate Interior and Insular Affairs Committee to introduce a bill in 1961 to establish the executive mansion as a national monument under the auspices of the national park system. In which case, the White House would have ownership of donated artifacts. And if they were moved from the White House, they would go to the Smithsonian. So like people's precious items would remain precious. And then of course, after Life Magazine, we actually get to see this happen in real time, February 14th, 1962 to a televised audience. She gives this tour of the White House and it is a triumph. Um, I think to modern audiences, it seems strange, but to people in 1962, like the reviews in newspapers around the United States are tremendous. That she presents as professional, as educated, as cultured, um, as someone with expertise in her own right. Um, so it's a CBS news special. I mean, people want to like recordings of it um, to show in schools. And again, for a way of thinking about her as apolitical or ornamental, yada, yada. No, no, no. If that were true, the United States Information Agency on behalf of her, her husband's administration would not send this around the world to send for people to watch like behind the Iron Curtain slash also everywhere. Um, there is a careful tracking of international response as well. And I'm gonna conclude here with a review from the British newspaper, The Daily Sketch. All the stuffiness was knocked out of diplomacy by Jackie Kennedy and her guided tour of the White House. Jackie Kennedy was 90% of the CBS film's success. She brought a new dimension to diplomatic behavior, which searching for the diplomatic word was her femininity. Her breathy, slow, enticing talk is as warm as the girl's voice in an aftershave commercial. One can imagine starched collars corrugating with suppressed excitement at diplomatic functions she attends. I mean, fine. <laughs> I think the challenge here is for Kennedy, for women in public more broadly, She's smart and professional and prepared and also beautiful. How can these two things be true with the, or these various things? How can you be both smart and good and beautiful? Like two things being true at the same time is blowing people's minds. Um, how can we take somebody seriously who looks like this? How could this person who presents in this way be also political? Um, and I think this is like the need for us to expand our ideas about what political is and does and who presents in that way and how we assess these figures. I mean, both in real time, but I think as we look to the past. So thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. We, we couldn't see you. Now we can, good. I just wanna make sure for the question um, portion that you had your camera on. So yep, we have here. a few questions for you. Um, you talked a little bit about 
Eisenhower and maybe Eisenhower's um, reception or reaction to Jackie. I'm wondering if you could talk about Lady Bird because I know there's some um, discussion of Jackie and her reaction to like Lady Bird keeping a notebook and writing everything down and taking notes from her husband and that she made a, a similar or an attempt to make a similar video um, or film to Jackie as related to cleaning up Washington DC. Um, can you talk about that reaction and that relationship between the two of them and media reception? Yeah, I, you know, and I know that there is um, the book that has just come out based on Lady Bird's notes and her diaries. I have just ordered it and I was thinking, it was like a perfect interview I listened with the author. It was a perfect thing for me to listen to in preparation for doing this. Um, you know, I always think of Jackie Kennedy thinking about Lady Bird, like handing duties off to her and Lady Bird being like, yes, of course I will do it. Um, that she's very dutiful in this capacity. Um, and, but Jackie also being critical and being like Lady Bird crawl on her hands and knees across broken glass for Lyndon. And it's not a compliment. <laughs> um, like the idea being, this is not what Jackie Kennedy would do. Um, I think Lady Bird Johnson is very kind to her and particularly is very kind to her in the wake of the assassination. Um, and there are rotten reviews or assessments of Jackie Kennedy. Like, can you believe she stayed in the White House for two weeks after her husband was murdered right next to her? And like it, reporters ask Lady Bird Johnson and she's like, listen, if this is the thing I can do to give this person comfort, I am glad to do this. Um, she is a very different kind of political spouse. But my sense is, yeah, I think Jackie was prickly about the note taking, but I think ultimately their relationship was mutual respect and kindness as an overall. We have a question here. Um that Jackie Kennedy was international and brilliantly strategic and crafting image has long been clear. How much autonomy did she have within her marriage and with White House image control um, to pursue these projects? Was there pushback, conflict, or was it okay because it was seen as serving a larger purpose? I think there's a lot of push and pull. I think there are things she does that John Kennedy does not like, um, especially when she goes on these European vacations um, in the summer and she is water skiing and she has Caroline water skiing with her um, and like is wearing a bikini or she's on like yachts of like, quote unquote, like unsavory characters. I think when she's like off the clock or she's like out on her own, she does it. And I mean, who's going to stop her? She's across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but I think she, it is not unusual for her to get a telegram that's like, rein it in. Um, I do think, you know, when she, her look and I, her language is such an asset to him and her culture and her ability to communicate and the sort of soft diplomacy she brings places. And I mean, she goes with Lee to India and Pakistan and she does it. And she, I think, Again, when she is there, you can suggest to her what she should do. But I think when she's on the road or around the globe by herself, Jackie Kennedy does what Jackie Kennedy wants. I also wanted to ask you about media and Jacqueline's children because she was very protective of her children um, yeah. to a point where um, she had to be out of town for her husband to set up the very famous photo shoot. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, I think she's livid. <laughs> that it is, I, you know, I was like talking to my running partner as we were going and I'm like, she would leave town and he'd be like, life, come on over. Um, and, you know, it's, it was very funny sometimes that then she would look at the pictures and she's like, oh, but I love this one. Can I get a copy? Um, I think she didn't, like, she was very, she wanted the control. Like whatever went out there, she wanted to decide that it went out there. Again, like she, I think she would like to have her look represented, but she doesn't want like the kind of headline 
that is not the headline that she doesn't want. And I don't think she wants her children on like above the fold of the newspaper plastered everywhere. She, I think there is very much this desire to maintain as much of like a normalcy or a privacy for them. And I think there is a big difference between the Bouviers and the Kennedys. Like the Kennedys love publicity. And I think part of it is the Kennedys have a party line and the party line is the Kennedys are the best. Whereas I think the Bouviers are like this more complicated or contentious group. And I think that upbringing, and I think also like the pedigree of the sort of her class status, like the old money, leads her to have this very different relationship to publicity than her husband has. Can you talk about her role in the campaign? She was pregnant and at home. Was there anything that she did to help? Yes, she, I mean, she goes on the campaign trail with him for a while. Um, and I think there are some people who suggest that members of the Kennedy team think her pregnancy is a blessing because it gets her off the campaign trail. Like they are afraid or they do not like her missteps. Um, like most famously, she goes, um, I think like to the Waldorf Astoria and is trying on maternity dresses in a room full of reporters. And they talk to her about what she spends. And she said something along the lines of like, I couldn't spend that much money unless I wore sable underwear. And of course, it's very scandalous that she would say the word underwear. <laughs> um, so I think there is this way where it's like, good, keep her home. And they have a campaign wife column, ostensibly written by her, um, that talks about why she thinks John Kennedy is such a good candidate, how she is interested in education, like basically just like, what is she doing? How is she paying attention? Um, why should women vote for her husband? So she does have this like writing component that is in support of his efforts. So correct me if I'm wrong, but she also had a miscarriage while she was serving as first lady. Can you talk about how the media received that, especially in relationship to first ladies who have been through those kinds of experiences, whether it's breast cancer or addiction? I'm really interested in, in what the treatment was. Yeah, it's actually even more traumatic than that. Like she delivers a stillborn baby or not stillborn. I think the baby lives maybe for three days. Um, it is, it has been difficult for me to find coverage of it. Um, I think largely because this is like sort of gentleman agreements era. And even she has had miscarriages and she had a stillbirth. Like her pregnancy life is fraught with peril. Um, there's so little discussion of it. I think with the idea, this is private and terrible, it happened. Um, it's much more a topic I, ha I have knowledge or understanding of from memoirs or autobiographies of people close to the Kennedys because they talk about this as being you know, a horrific moment for them but also in some ways like this unifying force where it brings them closer together as they are enduring this trauma very publicly, even if it is not being discussed so publicly. There's a question in the chat about the White House furnishings. What does the White House look like today in relationship to Jacqueline Kennedy? So I'm wondering within that context, can you talk about the White House Historical Society, some of the mechanisms that Jackie helped to establish? I mean, my sense is that the book that she wrote to accompany the restoration that is like a tourist or not a tourist, I guess like a souvenir book is still in print that this is something that you will buy when you go there. And it's very um, sort of accessible, like a lay person's understanding of what's going on in the White House. Um, my sense is that there's been a continuation of this. Like no longer can you say, oh, I just love this thing that I had in the White House. I'm gonna take it home with me. Um, that there is this attention to history. Um, and I mean, I guess the last time I was in the White House was early 2016. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know. I think the White House has not been open to the public in the way that it once was. Um, 
So I sort of don't know what's been going on in there. How did the media reception change after the assassination and her life after serving as first lady? I mean, I think that's when people are like, this is America's queen. Um, and the number of people who are like, you are first lady forever in my heart. Um, it is so positive. And the, the things that she is, I mean, really, that is when the image making and the cultivating of a narrative about her husband, about his candidate or about his administration um, is very clear. And I mean, this orchestration of that funeral is nothing short of masterful. She knows exactly what she is doing and she communicates exactly what she wants to communicate. Um, and I mean, in writing the chapter about his assassination and the response, like it's an embarrassment of riches because there is so much material. Um, I mean, any sort of newspaper around the country, but then Congress basically just has a couple days where they allow representatives to do eulogies and all of those have been printed. So you have people talking about John Kennedy, but very often being very like gushing and grateful to the sort of dignity, um, the way Jackie Kennedy brings honor back to the nation that had been like washed in shame. And I mean, what's great is that a lot of these representatives and senators are like, and I would let the record show, I am also submitting what my hometown newspaper wrote. So it is just like this massive outpouring, um, I would say largely of gratitude. So we have one last question for you. Can you talk about other first ladies and how Jacqueline Kennedy's legacy and her sense of image making may have influenced them? Yeah, I think the most um, direct and who has been very open about it is Michelle Obama. Um, and I think keeping this, this attention to public and private life um, and maintaining a sense of normalcy uh, for the family. I think Michelle Obama definitely has reflected, and I think her look too, that a lot of times, and especially <laughs> like being sleepless, um, having this very classic look, being somebody who cultivates an image of excellence, um, of culture, of, of being somebody we want to represent us, um, many times would bring me back to thinking about Jackie Kennedy. Well, Karen, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in reading your research related to Jacqueline Kennedy, do you have any published papers or when will the book be released? Um, I have an article about Jackie Kennedy that's largely about um, the White House tour that is in a Taylor and Francis journal called The 60s. And it's a journal of American politics and culture in the 1960s. Um, and the book, I have three chapters that I will be writing. So soon, I would love to say, um, yeah, I it will probably be several years um, until I have my next sabbatical and I can really dedicate myself. But I hope that I can come back and talk more about what I have found. Definitely, Karen Dunak, we look forward to having you here in person um, for yeah, book release. Yeah. Speak. Um, and thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today for this talk. And please head to the National First Ladies Library website or social media to register for further events. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.